And you guys need to give a really loud round of applause for our last presenter as it is closing us out today. Um, I'd like to present Janiel Monteleone. She graduated from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri with her doctorate in physical therapy in 2021. She became a board certified clinical specialist in orthopedic physical therapy. She's worked as a sports physical therapist at Children's since 2017 and has also contributed as a lecturer in our residency program. She's a competitive athlete who played college basketball at Whitman College before playing professionally in Germany. She put the city down, I can't pronounce it, so I skipped that one. Um, and she continues to be a lifelong athlete by playing basketball both in San Francisco and Oakland throughout the year. So help me welcome Janiel. All right, so I'll be talking about female athlete considerations when it comes to kind of the medical field in general, as well as physical therapy and then injury prevention. Um, I have no disclosures. These are the course objectives below. I'm not gonna read them aloud, but hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll know the three major components of the female athlete triad. You know how to access, assess the components, you'll know how to screen for them, um, how there might be performance-based implications by them, and then I'll briefly touch on REDS, but the group before us did a great job. And then something that's a little bit more near and dear to my heart is uh, prevention programs in female athletes specifically um, and the ACL. Um, hopefully these are familiar athletes to you. They are very prominent female athletes currently. We have uh, Asia Wilson as the WNBA champion from last year, the current US Women's National Soccer Team. Um, Allison Felix, a very prominent sprinter in the one, the two, and the four, and then Simone Biles as the gymnast. So kind of the history in the female athlete triad, um, originally in 1992, the American College of Sports Medicine formed a panel to discuss disorders they had commonly seen in adolescent or female athletes. They coined the term the female athlete triad. Um, in 1997, they put out their first position stand and it consisted of three components. You can see in the diagram of a triangle, you have on one end disordered eating, another corner amenorrhea, and then osteoporosis. Um, and at this time you had to have all three components in order to get the diagnosis. Um, we've come a long way from that. And so the current thought behind the female athlete triad is now a spectrum of interrelated components. So you can see in the green on one end is your optimal energy, your optimal bone health, and then normal menses. And then there's a spectrum of that there could be some um, disorders and those things before kind of the truly negative effects of all three components. You also no longer have to have all three components, so we can catch these athletes a lot easier and give them the help they need. The prevalence of the female athlete triad, um, it's most commonly seen in lean, aesthetically based, subjective judging endurance sports, such as cross country, gymnastics, figure skating, swimming and diving. However, it can happen in any athlete. So you cannot just um, think it's only the lean or subjective judging sports. Adolescent athletes are likely to experience higher prevalences of amenorrhea and menstrual cycle disturbances. It was found in a study that adolescent runners were shown to have higher prevalence of amenorrhea than adult runners, 67% compared to nine respectively. So we'll kind of now go through each separate component. The first one will be um, energy availability with or without disordered eating. Energy availability is how much energy that remains after exercise. Um, and so it is considered low energy availability if um, the threshold below with which unfavorable physiological changes in metabolic status, reproductive function, and bone health occur. This threshold is 30 kilo cal, um, kilogram fat-free mass. The recommendation is for each female athlete per day to have around 45 would be the ideal to stay healthy as an active female athlete. Um, the four pathways for low energy availability you can have disordered eating. You can have intentional weight loss without disordered eating. You can have inadvertent under eating or clinical eating disorder. Um, low energy availability causes your energy to be redistributed to more of the essential metabolic needs and away from some of the less essential needs such as growth and reproduction. How do we assess low energy availability? So we can think of a BMI of less than 17.5. However, in adolescents, they recommend less than 85% of it expected body weight. Um, and this, a sports nutritionist or exercise physiologist would be the perfect person to calculating how much you know, energy availability athletes are getting and their whole energy availability assessment, um, kind of out of our scope as a PT. 
The second um, factor we'll talk about is menstrual function. Um, I like to kind of just go through what the definitions are because we weren't really taught too much about this in physical therapy school. Um, normal menses is women over the age of 15 are expected to have a normal menses every 28 plus or minus seven days. Oligomenorrhea is menstrual cycles greater than 35. And then amenorrhea, you can have primary or secondary. Primary is a delay of menarche until age 15 or after age 15 with the presence of normal secondary sex characteristics. Secondary amenorrhea was the absence of menses for at least three months in a woman who was previously menstruating or less than five menses in a year. Um, one thing is this will be fully evaluated by uh, MD to rule out other conditions as well, um, like pregnancy, endocrinology, things like that, that could be causing the amenorrhea. Um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion once you've ruled out everything else. Um, and that is uh, resulting from low energy availability, which causes the hypothalamus to decrease gonadotropin releasing hormone, which causes cause a kind of a cascading effect. Um, so it decreases luteinizing hormone and then follicle stimulating hormone, which then in turn decreases estrogen and it causes ovulation and menstruation dysfunctions. Ideally, if you have optimal menstruation function, um, you're dependent on having that good fuel, that good availability of energy, so that all of these things function properly. The third component will be bone mineral density. Um, bone health concerns specifically for female athletes include failure to achieve peak bone mass, low bone mineral density, low volumetric bone mineral density, compromised bone geometry, decreased bone strength, and increased stress reactions and stress fractures. Um, stress fractures are two to four times more common in amenorrheic athletes than menstruating athletes. So this is something to kind of, uh, I feel like it's a good clinical pearl there to remember as you're screening your athletes. The greatest predictors of low bone mineral density are later age of menarche and low BMI. There's also additional risk factors you can look for of menstrual irregularity, weight loss, disordered eating, low energy availability, and restrictive eating behaviors. Um, bone health problems can be generated by both estrogen dependent and estrogen independent mechanisms. Um, estrogen dependent, um, so hypoestrogenism is associated with amenorrhea. When you have that low estrogen state, it um, upregulates bone resorption and promotes bone loss by stimulating osteoclast genesis. Whereas the estrogen independent mechanism is due to low energy availability, which then can cause effects with metabolic hormone alterations and can occur and affect bone metabolism. This is kind of just a reminder um, how estrogen plays an important role in controlling osteoblasts and osteoclasts. If you have a deficiency in estrogen, it leads to increased osteoclast formation and enhanced bone resorption, and thus a very negative thing. Um, specifically looking at adolescent female athletes, um, young female adolescent athletes are typically, um, are especially at risk in 90 to 92% of their peak bone mineral density is typically reached by age 18. And the greatest period of bone accrual is between ages 11 and 14. So we're, as providers, in a really kind of important time frame where we could screen these athletes and catch these um, athletes who are at risk so that they don't have lifelong problems. How to assess bone mineral density. Um, so this is kind of a cumulative risk assessment grid that's um, pretty thorough but it's kind of in order to understand if you need it to order a DEXA as a physician or not, they would have to have greater than or equal to one high risk triad factor. The high risk factors are on the far right um, or greater than or equal to two moderate risk triad factors, which are more in the middle. So you can go kind of down the chart and see how many of these things the athlete may or may not have. And then you kind of have a better um, understanding of whether they may need more imaging. Uh, from a physical therapy standpoint, uh, clearly we're dealing with all non-pharmacological recommendations. So if they are under eating, most of this all comes to referrals. We are referring to a sports dietitian and our exercise physiologist for complete assessment of energy expenditure. If there's disordered eating, you're referring to a physician and sports dietitian. If there is intentional weight loss without an eating disorder, you're referring to a sports dietitian. And if there is a clinical eating disorder, then there's multiple factors. You have the physician, the sports dietitian, and a mental health practitioner. 
But as a PT, um, we're just, if we <coughs> happen to hear or see any of these things in our exam, we are referring out for further examination. I will say as a PT, we spend a greater amount of time with these kids over the course of months to almost a year, and we get a lot of information from them. They open up a lot. So we typically are the first to see a lot of these things, and we refer back to you guys. Um, in order to kind of target low bone mineral density, um, it's all about kind of diet, getting your weight back into a stable state or eating more, decreasing maybe the exercise temporarily until you can get better um, back to your proper menses and prevent further bone loss. So kind of treatment of the triad, how long do these things kind of take to normalize? Of course it depends, but the first thing that'll come back is your recovery of your energy status, um, which hopefully takes days or weeks once you get the help you need from a dietitian. Your menstrual function will come after months, and then the recovery of bone mineral density could take up two years. Um, but the first thing that we want to kind of prioritize is our an energy status to kind of normalize that, and then it will kind of have the um, trickling effects on the other portions. I think as providers, like what can we do is screen. So early detection of these athletes is key, um, especially between that 11 and 14 year old period where they have the biggest bone accrual. Um, these screening questions should take place during your pre-participation evaluation or in the clinic if you're seeing someone with a stress fracture or reaction. There's no reason you can't ask your female athlete these questions. Um, it's a perfect window to help the athlete and it should be a team approach. Like I said, we might be the first provider to see it. The ATC might be the first provider to hear one of these things. It might not always be the PCP or the sports medicine um, physician. I think the screening questions are a good thing to add maybe to an intake form as a physical therapist or part of the, of course, the pre-participation evaluation. The questions consist of, have you ever had a menstrual period? How old were you when you had your first menstrual period? When was your most recent menstrual period? How many periods have you had in the past 12 months? Are you taking any female hormones? Do you worry about your weight? Are you trying or has anyone recommended that you gain or lose weight? Are you or on a special diet or trying to avoid any food, specific foods or food groups? Have you ever had an eating disorder, a stress fracture? Have you ever been told that you have low bone density? Um, so I do think we should start normalizing these questions as well. I've been asked in previous kind of discussions, you know, I don't feel comfortable asking this on day one. You can always have them fill out a form and then that's an easier way to start the conversation. This is kind of what would help us decide when the athlete might be able to return to sport or if they are safe or unsafe, given the questions they've answered and the assessment you've done at, during your evaluation as a uh, physician or PT. Um, so it's a cumulative risk assessment. So it's just like the other one for finding whether they need a DEXA. You get points for different risk factors. So low risk factors, you get zero. Moderate risk factors, you get a point. And high risk factors, you get two points. Um, once you check all the boxes and figure out how many total points they are, it can help guide you on whether the athlete is safe to return to sport. Um, so if they have zero to one points, they're low risk, so they're full clearance, let them go. If they have two to five points in that risk stratification model, then you might give them provisional clearance, which is you can return to sport if you follow these guidelines and you're keeping up with your nutrition, you're seeing your mental health provider, whatever those may be or limited clearance. You can go back to sport, but you can only do 50% volume. Um, restricted from training or competition would be greater than six points. Um, and it was shown in the research that a written contract is be more beneficial than a verbal contract. So stating what they need to do to return to sport. You need to you know, do this, that, and that, and then share it with the entire overall team that's treating the athlete, whether that be the dietitian, the sports physician, the PT, the athletic trainer, the coach, the parent, whoever's involved, so that everyone knows what steps they have to pass in order to, before they're cleared for sport. Future research clearly needs to be done, but this is kind of what they have right now um, to see if this kind of risk stratification model improves outcomes for female athletes. Um, like I said before, it's a very, it's, there's a lot of components when clearing an athlete for sport, and it ultimately depends on the physician but it should also be a team approach. Um, there's medical factors that are involved in blue. There's also kind of the type of sport they play, the position they play, the competition level they play will come into this decision making. It's also the timing of their season. Are they in season? Are they out of season? The pressures from the athlete, the pressures from the parents, all of these things 
you know, take into, you have to take into consideration on is it safe and best for the athlete. So who can make up the care team? It can be a variety of these people, but I feel like the most common one would be the team physician or their primary care physician, a sports dietitian, a mental health practitioner, physical therapist, athletic trainer, the athlete's coach, and the family member. So the role of the physical therapist specifically, um, we're not the ones managing this, but we can definitely screen them on the questions from slide 18 to see if they need to see a specialist and refer to that provider. Um, we can do some education on the components of the triad, basic nutrition, signs and symptoms, overtraining, um, things like that. But really what comes down to is recognizing the symptoms from the screening questions and referring. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is, this is one model specific to females, but there's also, like the group before me said, the relative energy deficiency in sport, which um, also takes into consideration male athletes. I'm not gonna spend a whole a lot of time on this because they did, but it is centered around low energy availability and the direct effects it has on a multitude of systems in the body, as well as a multitude of factors um, that the athletes are dealing with. It was recently updated in 2023 um, so it's a great article that the previous group also mentioned, and if you want to read it, you can. But it is centered around that low energy availability. It includes both male and female, and um, it can have direct effects on metabolism, reproduction function, musculoskeletal health, immunity, hematologic, cardiovascular, kind of a little bit of everything. The best research, though, are on the triad components, so bone health, menstruation function. All right, so we're gonna change gears into injury prevention specific to female athletes. Um, for physical therapy, our practice guidelines just came out for exercise-based knee and ACL injury prevention programs, kind of were updated in January of 2023. Um, and the impressive research that was came out with a meta-analysis and a system, systematic review stated that with an injury prevention program, there is a 53 to 67% reduction in ACL non-contact injuries, which is huge. So the evidence in the clinical practice guidelines that was given an A level or strong evidence are the following. Clinicians, coaches, parents, and athletes should implement an exercise-based knee program prior to practice or games in female athletes to reduce the risk of ACL injuries, especially in athletes younger than 18 years of age. A uh, subgroup that they kind of had the most research on were specifically soccer players. Both women and men should use an exercise-based knee injury prevention program to reduce the risk of severe knee and ACL injuries. Um, the prevention programs used for women should have multiple components. There should have proximal control exercises, strength and plyometrics. Balance was in some of the research, but it was given more of a C grade, not an A grade. The dosage, um, it should be training multiple times per week, trainings lasting longer than 20 mi minutes and volumes that are longer than 30 minutes. These programs should be implemented in the preseason and continued and performed throughout the regular season. The kind of the other key factors were that clinicians, coaches, parents, and athletes must ensure high compliance when it comes to these programs, especially in female athletes. I think that's a critical component is not just the clinicians, but it's the whole team, the clinician, the coach, the parent, and the athlete, they all need to be on the same page. Um, and then the next two are clinician, clinicians, coaches, parents, and athletes should implement exercise-based knee injury prevention programs in all young athletes, not just those athletes identified through screening as being high risk for ACL injury. Um, and then the last one is for the greatest reduced um, in future medical costs and prevention of ACL injuries osteoarthritis or total knee replacements. Um, we should encourage implementation of exercise-based ACL injury prevention programs in athletes 12 to 25 years of age in sports with high risk of ACL injury. So I know that was a lot of words, but they summed it up in a nice um, chart. And so you can see in the first box, the program specific for reducing all knee injuries and then the program specific for reducing ACL injuries. The second block, you can see the specific subpopulations they studied. So on the far left is women under the age of 18 and which ones would be best for them. Then in the middle, you have the soccer players and then handball players. It has the dosage and delivery we talked about, greater than 20 minutes um, for each duration of 
throughout the starting the preseason and then maintaining throughout the regular season. And then the program should be implemented to all young athletes, not just this one screen for high potential for injury. And they should be um, specific to kids ages 12 to 25 participating in high risk sports. They define high risk sports um, as rugby, Australian football, netball, soccer, basketball, and skiing. So I think as a whole, we can all do a much better part of educating our patients and providing, you know, there are these programs that exist that really reduce the chance of a knee injury and ACL, um, ACL injury. We could also probably do a better job of getting out in the community, helping with these athletic programs, whether they be club sports, high school programs, working with ATCs. I think we could definitely improve that. It's a, it's a whole system issue though, where we all need to work on it. Um, so yeah, these are my references and that's, that's it. Thank you all so much. Yep, absolutely. Have, have a seat. And any questions that we have for this wonderful actual two lectures to close out the <laughs> afternoon? Sorry, the buzz got me. Question? Um, Excellent. I have been noticing such an increase in disordered eating behaviors, both in athletes and in teenagers who exercise daily outside of organized sports. Um, and in the community where I work, which is pretty low resource, referrals often take months and months. Um, and in the meantime, I often feel like I'm watching my patients slip away. So I'm wondering if you have any like concrete nutritional counseling, specifically for like the pre and the post workout meal. Do you have anything like not calorie or like macronutrient counting, but any general, but concrete recommendations for that? Yeah, that's a great question, especially when the access to um, dietitians is really limited. So um, I often refer patients to the Team USA Nutrition website, um, which has pictures of athlete plates and what those should look like and how they differ based on the intensity of the workout they, they did. So they have like a kind of low or easy day, medium day or moderate intensity day and high intensity day. And the composition of the plate will look different based on the workout. So those are, you can even have those printed out in clinic and just hand them out, like have them stapled together or you can point them to that website. They also have like PDF fact sheets on pre-workout, post-workout nutrition, hydration. So you can just Google Team USA Nutrition and they have a lot of um, great like pre-made PDFs um, that you can either have printed or point your patients towards. So that's usually what I start with for um, in addition to just doing that counseling, but you only have so much time in a clinical setting. So um, that's a great place to start. I would also just add, um, what I find with high school athletes is they're tied to what their parents provide as far as food and so really you know i don't really dive into um what type of food is better necessarily but my messaging is if you want to if you want to really be your best as far as performance you have to take calories in before that activity and so i address it from really making sure they understand that about an hour before they do practice competition anything they should be eating something and I usually leave it as open-ended because oftentimes it's just whatever they can get their hands on, which is not great, but we're talking about just trying to reduce injuries and, and maximize um, the energy availability they have. And so that's, that's the tack that I take. Um, my question is just in education for the community. So the community that I'm in um, may have access to resources, but also has very busy schedules, including very busy sports schedules. So in educating these families who are very willing to listen, I'm a physical therapist, they're very willing to listen um, in the awareness of REDS and just because the, it's more openly being discussed now, what would you suggest besides taking time with each individual parent, as far as a website or a resource that I could share with them 
to just be aware. I think it would also help with um, parent awareness to disordered eating and, and just kind of lead them down that uh, pathway to understand where things potentially are going or what they could look out for. I don't have one specific resource that I point them to, but I think one thing that could be really compelling is I feel like sometimes pictures um, are worth a thousand words. And so just if you're in clinic or you're able to pull up those diagrams with all, um, all the different health, adverse health outcomes of REDS and be able to demonstrate how, um, just with one picture or diagram, how wide ranging REDS is and can be on um, the different body systems as well as on performance. I feel like you can sometimes get more buy-in from the athlete when you show them the different performance um, implications of REDS and then you can get more buy-in from the parents when you show them all the different health implications. And so those two together um, can have a synergistic effect. And so I think it can be helpful to even have those diagrams printed out in color in clinic that you can show, or um, you can you know, pull them up on the computer if you're um, working at a desktop in the, in the clinic. Um, and then they can always research it more on their own afterwards. And it looks like Dr. Chang has some recommendations as well. They have infographics on it. BJSM published this, and so there's infographics that are great, colorful. You can print those out to your patients. So just just Google. Thank you. Good S. That same um, the the publication um, that's listed in the references should be the yeah. same one from the British Journal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Have you had, what are your steps today, Tom? <laughs> I don't wear a requirement device. So I was wondering if you guys could talk to the audience about the difference between female athlete triad, which was developed when I was starting my um, sports medicine career, and the red S, because I, I can imagine there's probably some confusion in the audience about why they were both discussed. I'm happy to, to take a stab at that. So I think there's a lot of overlap between the two and they are um, two, as you alluded to, two different conceptual models. And I think um, initially a lot of the research was focused on female athletes specifically and the female athlete triad. Um, but what we realized as we conducted more research was that the um, implications extended beyond just um, adverse reproductive health and adverse bone health. Um, to include a really wide spectrum of consequences. And so REDS S is really just an expanded concept that goes beyond the female athlete triad to do a few things. One, it also includes male athletes. And although most of the research, um, a lot of which was focused on female athlete triad, like about 80% of the research that's in this most recent consensus statement is focused on female athlete. There's been a lot more over the past five to 10 years on male athletes. And we now understand and know that um, this syndrome and these effects um, are not only seen in female, but also in male athletes. So that's one um, expansion of this conceptual model. The other is an expansion beyond just looking at um, reproductive health and bone health, but realizing that this um, affects all these different systems, metabolism, um, cardiovascular health, um, mental health, um, also looking at hematologic health. And so it includes a much wider spectrum of consequences. And so I wouldn't think of them as being mutually exclusive. I would think female athlete triad concept kind of fits nicely within. Um, if you were to map it out, it would kind of map onto that diagram where um, that, that triad, um, you can see all three of those elements within REDS. Um, but it's just an expanded concept. And so they're not mutually exclusive. They kind of, the female athlete tribe fits within the expanded concept of REDS. Um, and depending on where you did your training and what literature you've read, um, you may speak more about one or the other, but ultimately um, they do have, share a lot in common. And I, would, I would think about REDS as just being a more expanded concept from the female athlete to include um, more holistically male athletes and other um, adverse health, but also performance. Um, outcomes, and that's one element of REDS um, that really is emphasized is it has adverse performance outcomes, which is really important to your athletes beyond just the health outcomes. Um, I don't know if either of you know anything else. All right, that's great. Sorry. Follow up. No, no, no. it's all right. Does anyone else have questions? Um, it also wasn't a great acronym, I have to say. When we first came up with it, Female Athlete Triad, people love writing out the acronym, and it's not a great acronym. Yeah. Um, 
Anyone else have any questions? Because I have one comment. And my comment would be, um, thank you very much for the presentation. And I think that we heard a lot of great comments from some of the people in the audience about why don't people understand overuse injuries are so bad, you know, like overuse, et cetera. And the thing, same thing about prevention of low extremity injuries, especially ACL. So, um, and this is the challenge to all of you that are here is to take that information and you become the Pied Pipers because it's a translation of research that doesn't get to our public. So when we can say that, you know, Mandelbaum, Bert Mandelbaum in 2000 published the data that, that high school soccer uh, players, females, reduced their ACL injury up to 75% by doing 20 minutes, three times a week of this ACL prevention program. And we still don't do it at our club level at our high school level, just not happening for boys or for girls. We don't, it's the question is why isn't this research data getting down to our public? And a lot of it is because, well, there's a, a lot of things, right? But I would, but the issue is, is that however much you can say it with your patients and you can keep saying it, translation of research into actual public health or public policy or um, actionable items in your clinics is really, really important. And so what we're trying to do, at least at the higher level, we talk about the triple down, you know, we talk about triple down economics and triple, triple down policy is we're not even really doing it at the professional leagues. So we should, and we're trying to mandate that so that we can get data that the triple down, but it hasn't, you know, we don't have that data at the professional league, even. So we're trying to establish that. But whatever you guys can do to have that voice would be great. Yeah. No, I agree. That I think in prison, at the prison conference, um, this was brought up as well. Is like, why do we have the data? Why do we have the knowledge? And it's not getting to the people, or if it is getting to the, um, the co at the coaching level, why isn't it being sustained? And that's the question I don't think we have to answer to, but that's what we should be looking at. Like, why we have this information so contact hours that's what it is it's contact it's hours. hard to do <laughs> but it's also coaches feel like i only have the field for two hours i don't have time for warm-up we're we don't have enough field space there's no time expectations and then at the professional level it's in college level it's contact hours I just want to say thank you for bringing this up because this is a new, the reds is new to me and I'm somebody who takes care of a lot of female athletes. Um, and I think a lot of them, when they hear the words female athletic triad, immediately assume that I'm talking to them about an e disorder and then they tune me out. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be, I think, something that's going to be a way that I can approach these athletes now without using the term female athletic triad and having them just tune me out immediately um, as a way to say I'm not accusing you of having an eating disorder, even though they might, um, you know, I can bring it up a different way. So this is actually, I really love this concept as a primary care provider, as a way to get to these kids without making them get more anxious and tune me out and not, not come back and see me again, so. And I think you can also frame it as that low energy availability is not always and often is unintentional. And I think starting with that can kind of um, set the expectation that it's not an accusation, but you're really just trying to um, get at those underlying processes that may be putting them at risk of all these things that they may not be aware of if they're um, unintentionally having low energy availability. I'm just going to say, I saw that building up in my population during the pandemic because I had all these kids who had all this extra time. Yes. It started training way more, and then all of a sudden, all these girls didn't have their period. And we and saw a lot of stress their, fractures during yeah, the pandemic. Yeah, like, all of a sudden, in 2022, yeah. I had all these kids. I ate way more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry, adults. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Any more questions? All right, well, I would like to thank the panel to close us out today. It was fantastic. It was a wonderful topic. I'm really appreciate it. Uh, keep clapping.